Well, hi, everyone. We are continuing our conversations for Education Impact Day 2016. And we are really excited to, I believe I said it, let's see, is hour 10, no, hour 11. This would be allow hour 11. If you're 11, then there's one more guest. So we're hour 11, hanging in there. Um, and Jared Stein from uh, Instructure um, Canvas. And do you consider yourself Canvas or Instructure or how do you, what do you call yourself? Yeah, so the company's name is Instructure, and Canvas is the, the flagship uh, flagship product, the learning management system. So um, in my um, interactions uh, with Jared, we use Canvas Network as part of our Open ABE MOOC, and so we've had some interactions um, with that and then working with um, um, Hillary, which is our contact from the instructional design side. So we've had a great relationship with with Canvas, and and thank you guys so much for doing what you do, the openness that you um, wow. allow us, as, as well as other um, nonprofits wow. and other universities to use the, your platform. Yeah, yeah, so, I'm, I'm glad we're able to. Yeah, so why don't you give us a, a little uh, overview of what you do at, at Canvas? Sure, sure. So I've been with Instructure for um, just over five years. Like last week was my five year anniversary. So. Um, it, it feels like a few weeks, though. There's, there's so much to do and, and so much to work on and, and so many different people to talk to. Um, but in my current role, I head up our product strategy for higher education. And so really what that means is I, I talk with a lot of people, I read a lot of things, um, and, I, and I try to have that all coalesce into uh, the, the vision, which becomes the roadmap for the development of the products and, and the services. And that's what we, we do as a business. Um, so, you know, I have kind of this great job where I, I look at a lot of research, I talk with a lot of uh, practitioners, and, uh, and I try to bring it all together. So we talked this morning, um, we had uh, Lisa Petridis from OER Commons on, and one of the things, the themes that we asked her some questions around were this idea of educational entrepreneurship. And I think those of us that started watching Canvas just as a little seed of an idea, and then to see how it's um, taken off. So can you give those of us that might not be as familiar, it's been a relatively rapid explosion and in a space that was pretty, it had a lot of pretty well-known and established players. So can you kind of take yeah. us through some of that, um, that aspect of it? Sure, sure. Yeah, and, and maybe one way to, to lead into that is, is talk a little bit about how I came to know about Canvas. So before joining the company, um, I worked in higher ed for about 12 years primarily helping uh, grow uh, online and blended programs and uh, did a lot of faculty development, a lot of team of instructional designers and so on and so forth. And of course, part of that was the LMS for good or for ill. And, uh, and I remember it was, it was now about eight years ago when the founders of Instructure uh, came and visited us at Utah Valley University and said, hey, we, you know, we hear you guys aren't too happy with your LMS and, and we have some ideas and they presented their ideas. And we said, hey, those are really, really great ideas. You're never going to make it. Um, <laughs> and, you know, we, we said, why? You know, there's, there's this behemoth in the market and they've bought up all the competition and now they're suing the only competition left. So good luck, guys. Mm -hmm. um, and, and then on top of that, there's just kind of the technical challenge of building a system that uh, tries to meet the needs of so many different educators, right? So many different disciplines, so many different teaching approaches. So it was really a you know Herculean uh, challenge for these these two uh, grad students, their students still at the time, uh, to try to undertake. Uh, but they were super persistent, and they uh, they kept talking and having dialogue with um, folks like myself around the country. Uh, and they didn't you know kind of jump in and start building software. Uh, they they just kind of engaged in this product validation tour that they they call it where. They presented ideas and they had discussions and they revised those ideas. And when they felt like they had a clear sense of what they could do differently, that's when they started um, writing code. And, and I remember um, they came to me, I think it was early December or November or something, uh, near the end of a semester. And they said, hey, you know, we've been having these conversations. Our software is almost ready to be used. You teach some online courses. So would you be willing to teach at least one of those courses on uh, Canvas if we get it done? And I'm like, yeah, sure. If you ever get it done, I'll teach a course. So they came back a couple weeks later and they said, hey, it's ready. 
uh, and so I taught on it. And, and it was, you know, it was pretty primitive at the time, um, but I saw some things in there that, uh, to me, uh, were kind of magical. And, and the main thing was just the ease of use of the system. Um, it was just a lot easier to use. It was pretty intuitive. I didn't have to look things up and, and learn. Um, but the other thing was that I could tell it was built with openness at its heart. And, and that's both from a technical aspect um, as well as from uh, a sense of, of, you know, being connected to the open web and preparing to, to embrace open educational resources and similar, similar type things. Um, so, so that's a little bit of the history. Uh, right before it launched as a commercial product, uh, they decided to open source the code, which was kind of their way of saying, uh, hey, hey world, you know, even if, if uh, another company were to acquire us, don't worry, the code is open source. The only thing they'd be buying would be the people, right? And that was sort of a way to inoculate, uh, inoc um, what's the word, inoculate themselves from the threat of acquisition. It was also kind of a, a strong stance in terms of their core value of openness. So that's how it started. Um, one of the earliest customers was the Utah Education Network. Uh, Utah Valley University was a part of that. And we've just kind of grown really steadily since then. Well, I just remember, and I, maybe I am really dating myself, because to me, eight years, I would not have guessed. I mean, I guess that really was it. And I was part of, they certainly didn't come and interview me personally, but I was certainly around people who were being talked, much like you. They were like, you should see these guys that have got this yeah. idea, and they think they're going to take on Blackboard and whoever and, and actually beat them. Are you kidding? And um, one of the first yeah. examples I had was um, the idea, and they, I think they were using this as an example, rather than building, uh, like Blackboard has like a, and I shouldn't probably name names, it might get you in trouble, but the competitors were trying to build everything in house. So a wiki, you know, the, to replicate like uh, Google Docs, in, rather than finding a way to, um, to pull in those, the, why, why recreate the wheel? And I, I'm kind of curious if that's maybe why they were able to turn yeah. things around for you, because rather than building their own wiki or, or collaborative document, that was their, seemed to be their, their model for production was figuring yeah. out what to pull in these loosely joined pieces. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, as, I, as I said, the, the technical task of building a learning management system is huge. And so how do you get into this market where there are incumbents who've been around forever building the, onto their code base forever and ever? Um, and, and so their approach was one to say, okay, everything in the design of this should be as simple as possible. And we need to think things through so there's not four different ways to create content. Um, but two, we don't have to be everything to everybody. In fact, that's a mistake. Um, what we can do is integrate best of breed tools into the system, but also create some technical avenues so that people can do that on their own as well without our permission. And, and that also gets to the heart of, of openness from a platform perspective. So I think, yeah, that was a big advantage. Um, for me as, as a practitioner, as somebody who, who taught, uh, my students were, were using blogs, like real blogs, not something called a blog inside of an LMS. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and they recognized that and appreciated that. And for folks like me, they said, you know what, though? You're still going to find value in Canvas because you still need to provide feedback and do the grading. And, and even track the student work. So we're sure. going to put that Aggregate, inside of right? this really uh -huh. elegant framework for you. Yeah. And, and students still do the work where they work, right? On their blogs, in their websites, on Google Docs, whatever it might be, the tools that they prefer. But your job as a teacher, the feedback loop, will facilitate that and make it easy. So, and and that, that was something that I really appreciated. So I think you've hinted at my um, next question already, but um, so what do you attribute the re relatively rapid rise in the, the adoption um, within higher ed that is, doesn't change very often, change mm -hmm. things very often? Yeah, yeah I, I thought about that a lot, especially as the, the company has matured and, and you know, my position in the company is to, um, to, to make sure that we fulfill our promises uh, while keeping the business healthy. Uh, and, and I think as much of it really was sort of a product of the time as it was um, the product itself. Um, but, I, but I think the one thing that we have going for us now is just really great people in the company. You know, I think because we started with some pretty strong values, uh, we were not afraid to talk about those values and those values affected every single hire that we've made. 
Um, the people in the company, man, they're fantastic. And it's the people and the experience that um, institutions and users have with those people that I think will make us successful in the future. Um, it, it, we, I've already mentioned working with Hillary, and you're so correct as far as the people that I've interacted with, um, you know, beyond just professionalism, just really listening to what I'm trying to do and trying to figure out a way to make that happen. Um, and it's like you said, there, there's some things that Hillary just says, no, we can't, we don't do that. We don't, <laughs> just you're not trying to yeah. be all things for all people. And especially when you're talking, I'm working with her from a the perspective of a MOOC and you've got a lot of people, um, you know, thousands of people. Um, and so it's, it's just been really a great experience to be able to pick up the phone or send an email and actually have a real human being that is, is going to give a thoughtful response um, to the question rather than pointing me to a, you know, some support page or something like that. So it's more mm -hmm. getting into the, the nuts and bolts. Um, and the, the, I also want to pick up on something you mentioned, the open openness um, side of things in, in the code and um, that you're, um, and now because I've been talking for 11 hours, my words are escaping me, but um, mm. what do you call the, uh, your annual uh, instructor con? Is that what it is? Yeah, yeah, we have, a, we have an annual users conference called instructure con. Uh, again, you know, we, we set out to make that a very different kind of event, uh, not only the kind of event that, that focus on the stories of um, people who are using the software, people who are figuring out new ways to use other software in context of, of our software, but uh, have a lot of fun, you know, uh, generate energy, uh, get, get the spirit that people have inside of them expressed and out in the open. So, yeah, it's a lot of fun. And so this year, um, I believe if, if I heard correctly, the theme was open, right? And it was, it was at the year yeah. of open, is that, if I remember correctly. So can you kind of touch yeah. on some of the, the themes that came up during, during the conference and how that would relate to, to Canvas and, and the work that you're doing? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, you know, Canvas launched in January 2011, and that was about the same time that we, we open sourced uh, the code. And, uh, and so, you know, it's been about five years and we decided to, to spend a good amount of our, our time this year uh, thinking about whether or not the, the, uh, the hypothesis or I guess the bet that we laid uh, that openness would enable innovation and, and help us, um, you know, give more power to more people. Was that bet actually paying off? And so we looked at it in three different veins. You know, the open platform, uh, open content, and open education. And, uh, and so, you know, we, we've published some materials that kind of reflect upon that. And we talked about it at the, the users conference as well. And, and that was the, um, the main theme, theme of my talk uh, there, where, where we kind of looked at each of those different elements of openness and showed some examples from the community of how uh, people were making a difference through openness, through those those three different avenues, and uh, some pretty cool stories, and uh, and I think it sets us up really well to continue to invest in openness, continue to fight for it, because it's not something that that people necessarily uh, put at the top of their list when they when they want things fixed in a learning management system, but but it's core to who we are, and I think it's uh, critical for the future. Yeah, and I, you know, I don't. I'm not here to get, you know be, give you a free sales pitch or get you anything, but I do yeah. want to make sure people are aware of the free things and the way that they can access um, open resources as well as as free resources. And so, uh, as you mentioned, there's the um, the from the resource side of the house, um, the Canvas Commons, right, where um, mm -hmm. folks mm -hmm. can share. So you want to we'll kind of go through them maybe one at a time, and maybe you could give a little a little yeah, overview yeah. of what what Canvas Commons is yeah. all about. Yeah. Yeah, sure. So, you know, um, we, we open sourced the Canvas code, which means anybody can download it and run it. We think most people will want us to run it for them, uh, and that's how we make money. Um, and, and so that's like an easy way to be open. Uh, the open platform capabilities I talked about before, it's an open API so developers can, uh, you know, get information out of Canvas and put it back in and develop their own tools that plug in really nicely. Uh, but then you get to stuff like open content. And uh, open content or, or open educational resources, I mean, this isn't a new idea. This has been around for a long time, and, and I've been involved in, in the open content movement for a number of years. Um, and there are some fantastic uh, platforms and libraries 
of OER out there, like OER Common. Um, but the, the challenge that we were trying to solve with Canvas, within Canvas, is, is really the challenge that I saw as I had worked with faculty over the years. Um, folks who know about OER and are excited about OER know how to find and use OER in their courses. Right? They're, they're determined enough to figure it out on their own. But for everybody else, they don't have any idea what it is. They don't know where to go to get it. And if they did know where to go, they would probably have a hard time getting that into their courses. So what we did with Commons is we, we, we created this platform um, that's kind of separate from Canvas, but so tightly integrated that anybody who uses Canvas for their courses is going to notice it right away and say, oh, what's that? And it's, and, and it's sort of a library of OER where you can browse through resources, um, everything from files to entire courses or modules. And, uh, you know, with just a couple of clicks, bring those things into your course and try them out and maybe change them inside of your course and share them back to Common. So the, the, the reuse and um, remix and sharing is just part of the whole experience of using Canvas. And, and, and that was our goal is just to kind of make the practice of reusing and remixing and sharing OER um, something that's a little more natural to day-to-day to -day teachers. I think that's a really um, good point. It took me a while to realize that. I w at first, I was thinking, uh, and we CC license, um, Creative Commons license our MOOC, so anybody can use it. Mm -hmm. And so I had always thought of uh, uh, Canvas Commons as being a place where you'd put your entire course. But um, I, I did not, I don't know why I didn't make the connection. It can be as, as small as like a, um, an assignment or something, you know, something a lot. Yeah. And I, we, we actually, um, we actually ended up downloading and sending the file this week, but it's also kind of a handy way if you're sharing, uh, the, sharing those materials rather than downloading, figuring out how you're going to physically share a large yeah. file. Um, so kind of has a hidden benefit that you can, we can use your, yeah, yeah. <laughs> use you as a big Dropbox almost to move. Files. Yeah, I, I mean, what, what people were asking for in the beginning was a way to share files, mm -hmm. uh, you know, text files or HTML files or whatever. And that's so boring. Um, you know, the IMS organization has a standard for packaging uh, resources, educational resources called a uh, common cartridge. And so Canvas Common, so confusing with, with all these commons, uh, Canvas Common uh, only accepts content in common cartridge format, and that's how it shares it back to, to, to Canvas. So um, Canvas Commons actually has its own API, and so you can pull stuff out of Canvas Common in common cartridge format and use that elsewhere. Did not know that. That's something new I yeah. just learned. So that's, that's, that's kind of a new thing. It's a little bit of a hidden feature, but um, you know, it's kind of important for us from a technology standpoint uh, to have those APIs in place because, again, those can be made available before any tool or user interface takes advantage of them, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. And then, at least for me, it's parallel. It's probably not for everybody, but within our MOOC, we have um, the students have the ability to, well, not have the ability, everybody has the ability, but we show them how to get a free for teachers account, which then will also dovetail and they can go in and get content um, within Canvas Commons. So would you want to just give a little, um, a little overview on what the free for teachers is and, and sure. again, free for anybody, right? Yeah, free for anybody. And this, I mean, this was one of the things we, we launched when we, um, when we launched Canvas, uh, you know, six, six years ago now almost, and it's just a free instance of Canvas. So uh, Canvas is a cloud platform like Google. There's no version. Um, it's just always the latest version. And free for teachers is the free version for individual teachers to set up courses and even run them there. Um, so yeah, it's, it's kind of a natural place to go if you don't use Canvas at your institution, if you want to access some of those resources that are on Commons or create and, um, and share those resources as well. Or host your own little class, right? If you have a face-to-face -face class and you want to have a, a, a small um, online component, that's a great way to test the waters, right? Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So Eugene was asking... There's a couple of questions. In, yeah, yeah, yeah go ahead. Uh, a couple uh, of questions in the chat. Go ahead. So, you so take Eugene them, asked, take them. what's the most successful effort, uh, effort Jared's found when introducing faculty who do not understand the potential of OER? Yeah, um, 
I, I did used to run uh, workshops directly for faculty on the advantages of OER. And for me, um, the best way in was to actually take them through the exercise of finding OER in the discipline in which they were working. And it didn't necessarily have to tie to a direct course, but um, introducing OER more as a workshop, a hands-on workshop, and less as a lecture, uh, for me, seemed to be pretty effective. Because once they both saw what was out there and then you know, kind of brought it into the environment that they had control over uh, so that they could play with it, you know, they might not end up using it in their class, but that's, you know, that's a quick view of, of how you actually get started with this stuff. And, and to me, that's the way to have the conversation. Um, I, I like the approach of saying, hey, you've got great stuff, you should share it with the world. But I found for the, the majority of, of instructors, um, you know, like, like all of us, we, we tend to think about what's in it for me first. And so if you show them great free resources that you can actually change, unlike the stuff that you get from the publisher, uh, that, was, that was a good way to start those conversations, especially if they were able to actually play around with it uh, in, in their course environment. And um, um, Nicola, by the way, is in uh, South Africa, and I believe it's like two in the morning there. So she is a oh, diehard. Wow. She, she bought into this you whole thought, concept. You thought of, you were tired, yeah. <laughs> exactly. She bought into our concept yeah. of webcast-a-thon here. Um, I, I believe she's saying um, yeah. that her question relates, can you track reuse? I think that's with Canvas Commons, I'm guessing, um, as far yeah, as Yeah, yeah. So, so Nicola, Canvas Commons tracks everything. Um, but we haven't surfaced a lot of the data on, on reuse. Um, but I have a small research team, and we did a little bit of this investigation uh, earlier this year uh, to understand how resources were being reused. Are, are they being reused mostly within an institution or being shared between institutions? And I think um, our conclusion, and, and this is, you know, Commons is still pretty new, but I think our conclusion was that uh, to date, most, most reuse of OER happens within an institution, um, but, it, you know, there are a lot of single resources or entire courses that are getting reused dozens and dozens of times by, you know, up to, I think, our, the highest count we saw was up to 115 different institutions. So, um, so yeah, the, the potential for reuse is, is, is amazing just because the, the Canvas community is growing. Uh, but we'll, we'll figure out a way to, to surface the reuse information eventually. I just, I don't know when. Um, I, if, if you're okay with it, I'd, I'd kind of like to, to talk about you and your role and like th the things that now we'll talk about you and your passions and I, in your bio, you, you mentioned the, the research aspect and some of the practice things you're interested in. So what are, what are some of your um, passion projects that you're looking forward to working on or that some stuff you're working on right now that we, we may sure. see down, down the road? Yeah. So, um, Always near the top of my list is, is just how can we simplify the user experience of Canvas. Um, it's, it's an ongoing challenge. It's more of a path than a destination. Um, but how, how can we continue to simplify that experience so that it gets out of the way? You know, I mean, when you think about, um, when, when you think about uh, cognitive psychology and the idea that we have only so much available Space in our working memory, or our, um, you know, uh, to, to to process what's going on in front of us. Uh, any interaction that we have with software is going to take up some of that, and that for a teacher means less time and energy that they spend on the stuff that really matters. Whether that's creating resources or more often interacting with the student, and so you know that's that's a continual challenge for me, and that's never going to leave my top ten list. Um, but from there. It's, it's a question of, okay, now how do we encourage uh, teachers and students to do more of what matters? And, and that's kind of a tough question because w what does matter in any kind of learning experience? Uh, every teacher is probably going to have a different answer for that. But I think one thing we, we tend to all agree on is that feedback loop, that continuous feedback loop between teacher and student and student and teacher. Um, that's so critical. And yet it's also so time consuming. Um, so, you know, if we can find ways to facilitate that to, in, to encourage 
more of that kind of interaction um, around the work that students are doing, then, then we'll be winning in terms of the, the user experience and, and what Canvas sort of encourages folks to do. Um, so that's, that's number one, you know, the user experience. Um, number two for me right now is, uh, is thinking about how, how outcomes can play more of a role in teacher's course design. And so outcomes, objectives, you know, whatever you want to call it, not, not in the, the sometimes pejorative instructional design um, world of, of outcomes and objectives where, you know, a faculty member might feel like outcomes are oppressive or objectives are oppressive because they have, it, it constrains them. But really in a way, uh, you know, outcomes are just the articulation of where you want students to be at the end of the learning experience. They, they represent your vision for student success. And, and so, um, you know, we're, we're thinking about how can we make that a little bit more, I don't know if I want to say appealing, but a little more useful to more teachers so that they get better at expressing that, for lack of a better term, vision for their students at the beginning of the course throughout all of their learning activities and that the evidence that students provide is directly tied to that, that vision of the outcome. So that's something we're, we're kind of working on right now. Um, and I think that's sort of a necessary work for us before we, um, we get back into learning analytics. And this is something where we've, we've done some work in the past. And, and last year we, uh, we uh, added a new feature called Canvas Data, which gives administrators access to a, a pretty complete data set that's optimized for analysis. But I think next year we're gonna spend uh, a fair amount of time uh, kind of rethinking analytics uh, as much from a student perspective as from the teacher perspective. That is to say, uh, what, are, what are the kinds of information that students would actually use to change how they go about learning? Whether that's their, their study habits or the time that they commit to, uh, to their courses uh, or, or even just a sense of their performance relative to others. I don't know what the right answer is, but that's where we want to spend some time doing some, some deep thinking. Um, you know, how, what, what could Canvas do potentially to make the things that are invisible to students more visible so that they can make better choices based upon it? Um, and I, I'd, I would be remiss if I didn't bring up a conversation you and I had. I think we, we almost forgot the conversation when we met the second time or talked the second time, but it, it's probably like three or four years ago, I think now. Um, and we were talking about ways that the Canvas, um, the LMS could be used outside of what we typically think, like a higher education, um, uh, a, a university would purchase the rights or whatever it is to mm -hmm. use. Canvas. And we were we were talking at that time about adult basic education. So I'm going to circle back to some of the themes we've talked about today and what a diverse and what um, heterogeneous uh, group it is. It may be a, a, a basement of a library. It may be at a faith-based center where you have open entry and students coming in and out. So. Um, I've, I've given you softballs up to this point, so now I'm going to hit you with the okay. hard ones. But you know, how 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 can that work? Um, you know, how what is some of the best, some thoughts on how people can access and and use Canvas for many, maybe many users, but not in a traditional manner where you have a semester long course and you know you're going to have 60 students and it's an easy way for Canvas as well as the institution to know how to charge for that, you know, purchasing that product. Yeah. How does that, yeah. any thoughts on that? The, again, continuing a conversation you had years ago on this idea. Yeah, I mean, um, I, I think for, for kind of a broad use of Canvas, honestly, that's, that's what we set up free for teachers to be. Um, if, if you've got, you know, some pretty specific use cases and you just need an LMS, you just need a place to post files or to, you know, connect people together. Um, you know, that's, that's what free for teachers is for G getting beyond that. Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, uh, on the one hand, we want Canvas to be flexible enough to address as many different instructional approaches and, and instructional goals as possible, um, but we're, we're not going to expand our 
kind of target market to include everything and everybody. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I don't know. Uh, Ask me more about that if, if that's not a good answer. No, that's, no, that's no, we talked about this a long time ago because our, our ultimate yeah. idea was um, with creating these, uh, the OER, the, the instruction um, instructors are able to use for adult basic education is it would, it would reside somewhere. And then we don't know yeah. who it might be that would just decide, okay, I'm going to work with this particular student and we're going to access this pot of resources. Um, and it may only be three modules out of the 75 that, that are available. And that's where I think our original conversation came in. And I, I hate to use mm -hmm. the example, but I'm going to use the example, like the Khan Academy in, in a way where it's, mm -hmm. somebody may come in, use something and leave. Um, and what we, I know it just gets difficult when you're thinking about, well, how would you charge? Yeah. Yeah. I, 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 I see what you're saying. Yeah. I see what you're saying. So um, in, in one possible future scenario, uh, Commons could be its own website and not just make it possible for educators to find and reuse those resources, but perhaps to allow for learners to interact with those resources on the fly. Um, that's not something we do today. Uh, it's, a, it's an interesting idea. We've, we've thought about it in the past for sure. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it, it would sense. be somewhere between like what Canvas Network is today and what Commons is today. Yeah, and we had a conversation uh, with Lisa early, Lisa Petridis from OER Commons earlier, this whole idea of the, the teacher facing uh, versus the learner facing. And as you're saying, mm -hmm. Canvas Commons is great for the, the teacher facing, the instructional designer facing. Um, and it's, yeah. you know, it's just, it's just a different, every, uh, but that's not unusual. Almost everything we talk about in adult basic education <laughs> It's just a different, uh, it's a different animal yeah. than, than what's... But, but it certainly does. I mean, that, that question, um, you know, represents one of the, the decisions that, that we have to face as a business and, you know, as a, as a product team, which, which I'm a part of. Uh, and, and that's, you know, who do you design your, your software for? And, um, you know, we've, we've always leaned toward being student-centered and toward, uh, incorporating features into Canvas that will benefit students, but that's a hard thing to continue to do when the, the, the dominant voice um, is appropriately the instructor, the one who does the design. Uh, and so if as a business, our audience were, was more of the learner writ large, right around the world, then, then that idea I think would be perfectly suited. As it is, we love the idea. It's then a question of how do we prioritize that um, versus our, our number one uh, stakeholder, you know, at this point in time, which is the instructor. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So if we, I just keep asking. Every time I talk to you, I somehow. <laughs> so no, we'll go, it's a great question. Yeah. Yeah. It. I don't yeah. know. Um, but like you said, yeah, the, and, it, the, the, the uh, free for teachers really has a lot of the people who are interested in it within our MOOC. That's exactly what they're going to do. Just take it as an individual back to, to their little tiny classroom and um, and figure out a way to have more of a blended approach. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Well, we're coming up uh, it's at the end. So here's here's our, our big question we've been asking everybody. Well, actually, it's kind of a two-part question. One, um, who has been your inspiration um, in, in you as, as far as your, when you're thinking of getting into education and, and this whole, um, all the stuff we've been talking about today? And then also the part B of the question is then, what do you want to be your legacy? So what impact will you make? Cool. Wow. Okay. Um, that first question. Uh, it would be so easy for me to talk about a guy that um, that has continued to inspire me over the years, who I, I'm sure other people have mentioned as well, David Wiley. Mm -hmm. but, but let me talk about um, uh, a friend and a mentor of mine who just passed away this year. Uh, some, of, some folks may know him. His name is John Crooch. He worked with me at Utah Valley University. Uh, and, and, you know, him and I were a really great, combination because uh, I would be more interested in the, the academic side while he would be more interested in the technology side. But we kind of came together around this idea that in order to move things forward, you just had to make it work. You, you, you had to hack things together and then you had to open up and share those things. And, you know, kind of in the beginning, um, we, would, we would go to a lot of conferences and take every opportunity that we had to talk about the stuff that we were doing whether it was fully baked or not, to get some ideas and conversations going. Uh, 
And so John was just so good at not only coming up with quick and dirty solutions for real problems that teachers had with technology, but also about kind of boldly sharing those and listening to new ideas and building this sort of perpetual motion machine of, of ideas and energy and, and technology solutions. So yeah, John Crouch, um, yeah, one of my ed tech sorry. heroes for sure. That, that's, that's, yeah. that's like a great, great person. I'm sorry for your loss. Yeah, a lot yeah. of people today have mentioned um, just the idea in general of passion. It sounds like, you know, he inspired you from his passion. For, Absolutely. And, for and, and honestly, just from making it work, getting something going, you know, not, not talking about grand ideas, but rolling up your sleeves and, and hacking something together and putting it out there, um, you know, prototypes for the win. So he was fantastic. Uh, in terms of my legacy, I, I don't think about that. I, I tend to dwell a little bit more um, in the here and now. And, uh, you know, my goal is wh whoever I'm with in this moment, if I can help, I will try to help. You know what? That is actually an awesome answer. Perfect. It's, it's a perfect answer. <laughs> Be in the moment. Uh, it, it's been really interesting. And I wish I would have been doing a better job documenting these as I've asked this. That's kind of in our fall you know, education impact has been our, our question. And I love this one. This is a brand new one that you're, you'll live in the moment and, and, and be, be present. So that's cool. And I feel that's, like you that's were. I can't plan any further than two weeks ahead. I <laughs> yeah. plan two weeks ahead, that's all. And I feel you were, <laughs> I felt the connection in AIDS. You, <laughs> you made an impact. So, well, thank you so much, Sharon. And feel free if you want to stick around right. or whatever. Thank we're just. You. We're hanging around for another hour with the, we got Eugene and now Jason's cool. got his son here, I see too. So, but thank you so much. All right. Thank, thank so you, much. Jennifer. Thanks everybody.